The views and opinions expressed on this program do not reflect the company, owners, management, staff, clients, or partners. It's Thursday, the 8th day of February 2024. Welcome to Bermuda's Daily Talk Show. It's the daily hour brought to you by the BAC Group of Companies, Medical House Lindos, and People's Pharmacy. I'm Jamel Hartman, and Maya Palacio will be with us in a bit to bring you the latest in what's trending before she brings you her news break a bit later. But um, anyway, folks, it's a lot happening, right? And um, I was trying to decide what we were going to discussed this morning and there are quite a few things in the news if you if you've been following it um in the tdh group last night there was some hot conversations some hot ones but you know we'll probably talk about that when sherry or sancha return because you know i don't want to raise my blood pressure being here alone but i'm um, happy thursday to everyone happy happy thursday and suzanne ingham says awesome thursday to you uh, Jamal and Maya, and happy Thursday to all of you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Maya's going to let us know what's trending in the news today, and then uh, we'll get into today's conversation. So let's bring Maya Palacio in to see what's trending. Greetings, MP. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. All right. So a lot popping, huh? Yeah, quite a bit in our news this morning. All right. Well, what, what, what's trending? What, what's the big stuff? Well, big stuff or stuff I don't really like to report on, but it happens on the island so frequently. But there was a multiple vehicle collision and a woman was injured. Uh, also, taxi drivers did have their protest. We'll get into a little bit of detail about that. And also some encouraging news about Balka actually partnering up with North Ants Primary and a lot more. All right. Thank you so much for that, Maya. Um, I think we're going to touch on one of those topics you just mentioned. I think we'll, we'll take over that and we'll see you in a few. See you in a few. All right. Um, so interesting, Belka and Northland's primary. And um, someone sent me uh, something about a collision last night, and I thought it was from before because it seems to be happening so often, but uh, not sure of the details, but I'm sure Maya will share more. Uh, but as I, th I think I speak for the entire community, hopefully everyone's good. Um, Amber Mapp says, good morning. Good morning to you, Amber. Uh, all right. So Look, greetings, everyone. Thanks for making us part of your daily routine. A good one today. As we welcome Dr. Mark Shard from the ASU uh, Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. Uh, I don't remember him being from there, so we're, we're interested to know about his switch, folks. And it's, you know, I remember going to, back then, they called it, didn't they call it the Bermuda, was it Biological Station? Am I aging myself? Yeah, I think when I was in school, that's what they called it. So I haven't been down there since then, since I was in primary school. And don't age me, but that was a, a, some time ago. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm sure the organization has evolved more in more than just names. So I, I would like to understand the important role that the institution plays in everyday Bermuda for everyday Bermudians, and I'm sure you would as well. The Daily Play is a name that plays. So someone will become eligible to win tomorrow's prize. So make sure you stay tuned for The Daily Play. It's a name that plays today. And um, let me just see something, hold on. What the question is. Oh, you got this. You, huh? Yeah, you got, you, you, you got this, you got this. That's an easy one. Name that place. Yeah, you got that. But anyway, in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe on our website. Follow us on all of our social media channels to stay up to date with all that we have going on. Help us grow beyond the mic as we do our part to continue to improve our community. All right, let's jump into it, folks. Let's jump into it. So um, 
<laughs> Good morning to you, Farah Palacio, as well. Uh, so yesterday, so I begin conversations, and Maya, I don't think she really appreciates this, but I'd be like, Maya said, or did you hear what Maya said? That's how I kind of begin my conversations, because that's where I get my news from a lot of the time. So don't you all do that? Don't you be like, well, Maya said, well, she did. Maya said there was going to be a protest. On Monday, she told us there was the taxi drivers were going to protest. So apparently, Charles H. Jefferson II in the comments yesterday said, well, there's a police presence at uh, the Transport Control Department. That's TCD. Well, according to our friends at the Royal Gazette, pro protesting cabbies were denied entry at TCD, right? So says cabbies were denied the opportunity to stage a protest in the transport control department's parking lot this morning with traffic officers turning them away. According to the Bermuda Taxi Owners and Operators Association, between 15 and 20 taxi drivers arrived at the TCD to highlight issues affecting their industry, but were asked to leave by the department's officers. Police officers were also present, but only to direct traffic, a Bermuda Police Service spokesman said. The taxi drivers instead drove past the building several times. BTOA members are unhappy about several matters, including no rate increase in a decade. Sherry Lynn Pringle, the secretary of the BTOA, said the disappointment came in the overkill from TCD using their traffic officers to block and direct traffic. I feel if it was totally unnecessary, sorry, I feel it was totally unnecessary for them to block both entrances. If they had just let us in the parking lot, everything would have flowed smoothly. The aim was to park in the car park and have the acting transport minister or the TCD director come out and address the driver, she said. Yesterday, we sent a message to, to the minister and his team was copied in on that, asking for answers to three simple questions. We want to know what the rate increase is going to be so we have something to negotiate to or from. We want to know what time rate three is going to be moved back to 9 p.m. from 10 p.m., she said. Rate three presently kicks in at midnight. Sorry, 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. And then the third was, and we want to further discuss the option of temporary permit taxis before government proceeds with the idea of allowing private cars to transport visitors, she added. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. And the question of the morning is very simple. Question of the morning um, is, what are your thoughts about the taxi protest? What are your thoughts about the taxi protest? But answer this simple yes or no first. Do you agree with police denying entry to, well, according to the article, it wasn't police. Um, do you agree with taxi drivers? Do you agree with the taxi drivers, um, taxi driver protesters, right? Let's, let's be clear, taxi, taxi driver protesters being denied entry to TCD. Do you agree with the taxi driver protesters being denied entry to TCD? That's a yes or no question. Do you agree with them being denied entry to TCD? Um, Yes or no? I mean, th this is a photo. Um, thank you so much, Maya, for supplying that. Do you agree with the taxi driver protesters being denied entry to TCD to protest? Do you agree with it? Do you um, find an issue with it? Let us know. Do you agree with it? What are your thoughts? Yes or no? Do you agree with the taxi drivers being denied access to protest at TCD? Yes or no? What are your thoughts on that? And, you know, as stated from the article, um, they were protesting a number of things, um, rate increase, right? They were protesting the time to move back to 9 or 10 p.m., the rate three, which is currently at midnight. And they wanted to discuss the option of temporary work per um, ta taxi permits, right, before government proceeds with the idea of allowing private cars um, to transport visitors. But what are, your, what are your thoughts? Do you agree with the taxi driver protesters being denied um, entry to TCD? What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts? Do you agree with the taxi driver 
protesters being denied entry to TCD. What are your thoughts? Um, give it to us. What do you think about that? Um, let's go to the comments. Um, Havelian Swan says, no, she doesn't agree. It was a peaceful protest. Um, it was a peaceful protest. It's interesting because is TCD public property? It's like that taxpaying public property. And would they have to, uh, here's what I find interesting about being denied entry. Um, what I remember in 2016, when protesters led by many PMPs, right? Protesters went on um, the parliament grounds to protest the airport and block the entry, right? I thought they were allowed, to, again, I could be wrong. I mean, I'm, this is not my area of expertise. I mean, no area really is, but why was that okay, but this is not? I have questions. I, I have a lot of questions. Um, so again, folks, what are your thoughts? Do you agree with the taxi driver protesters being denied entry to TCD? What are your thoughts? And we'll go to um, Amber Mapp says, absolutely not. Uh, let the people make some noise. Let the people make some noise. Uh, Suzanne Ingham says they have a right to protest and should not have been denied entry. Um, Charles H. Jeffers II says, no, um, but it's indicative of the issue. Instead of working out a solution, they block them and act like all is well. Uh, Farrah Palacio says, no, I do not agree. People have a right to protest. Well, see, <laughs> they'll say, well, they were allowed to protest. They just couldn't come on the grounds to protest, right? That's what they'll say to them, Right. Um, but what are your thoughts about the overall protest and what they're protesting, folks? What are your thoughts on that, too? Um, while answering, do you agree with the taxi drivers uh, being denied entry to a TCD to protest? Um, Renee Simmons says, no, I don't agree. The area is within their right to protest. They certainly cannot block the streets. It's peaceful protest. It's about time they take action. Okay. Um, Farrah Palacio says, I always think it's far when government money is used to put a stop to peaceful protest. That's not fair or right. If people have a problem, they should be able to protest. I concur. Again, I, it, it may be just me, but I just find it interesting that many people who were part of the airport protest when the OBA were government are the same people who are denying the same things to those who want to protest today. And is things like this that tells you it was never about the people. And we knew that if we're, I mean, if we're smart enough, we would understand it was never about the people, right? It was about what was politically convenient to help us get political power so that we can have a paycheck. Let's call it what it is. Let's call it what it is. So again, do you agree with the taxi driver? Pro and if you, you've just tuned in, we're discussing what happened yesterday uh, at uh, TCD. The, as Maya said on Monday, that the uh, taxi drivers were planning a protest at TCD on Wednesday, February 7th. Well, the cabbies were denied the opportunity to pro uh, stage a protest in the transport control department's parking lot um, with traffic officers turning them away. According to the BTOA, uh, between 15 and 20 taxi drivers arrived at TCD to highlight issues affecting their industry, but were asked to leave by the department's officers. Police officers were also present, but only to direct traffic, a Bermuda police service spokesman said. The taxi drivers instead drove past the building several times. Um, Sherry Lynn Pringle, the secretary of the BTOA, uh, said the disappointment um, came in the overkill from TCD using their traffic officers to block and direct traffic. So the taxi drivers are not happy. Um, and this, this, seems, this, this seems like the norm under the current administration. But what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts, audience? Um, bring it to us. What are your thoughts on the taxi protest period? Like, do you understand it? Do you think it's helpful? Do you think it's beneficial for Bermuda and Bermudians? What are your thoughts about the taxi uh, driver protests. Do you agree with their right to 
protest? Do you agree with what they're protesting and fighting for? Um, do you think this is helpful for democracy overall? What are your thoughts? Um, Farah Palacio uh, said, I will be honest, I feel like protesting against the taxi drivers uh, some days. Like, thank you for that, because there are people who are unhappy with the taxi drivers. Uh, but she says, so even if I do not agree with them, they have a right to voice their issues. Let me let me read that again. She said, quote, so even if I do not agree with them, they have a right to voice their issues. Folks, I say this all the time. I don't have to agree with somebody's fight to understand and believe that they should have a right to protest and fight for what they believe in. I think a lot of us are really stuck on what we like and what makes us comfortable. And we, we, we don't have clarity and look at it more openly like, you know what, that's just wrong. Thank you for that. Uh, Suzanne Ingham says, it's never about what is right for the people. Too much uh, politics um, interference. Um, Kenton Trott says, peaceful protest should always be allowed in a democratic society. But do we have a democratic society? Is this a democracy? These are the questions we have to ask ourselves. I, I guess my question is, and maybe we can reach out to TCD, is why refuse entry to taxi drivers? Was it a like lack of space in the parking lot? They didn't want to inconvenience other people? And do we even know if those people would have felt inconvenienced knowing what was at stake? Maybe TCD can answer those questions for us. I think this is setting a, a bad precedent. I think protests is a uh, way of determining how the people feel. If you take that voice and that that way aw that that away from them, I mean, it's it's arguable whether we have a democracy already, but that that helps very little. Um, Shikarina says. Is TCD parking lot considered public or private property? I asked that at the beginning. I actually asked that and no one answered. But if anyone can help us with that, is the TCD parking lot public property? And that's, I asked that when we first began this discussion because I compared it with the house, right? I believe that's public grounds, right? I could be wrong. Uh, Farah Palacio says, I bet if the taxi drivers protested against the state of the roads and went on strike, they'll get more of the public support. Well, <laughs> that's a hot one right now. That's a hot one. Uh, Renee Simmons says, I agree with them protesting, but I'm not sure what they are protesting about. I believe they should be allowed to protest regardless of their complaints. Well, maybe Renee is just tuning in. So I'll just reread what um, Royal Gazette, this is from uh, the secretary for the BTOA, uh, Sherilyn Pringle, she said uh, that the aim was to park in the uh, uh, car park and have the acting transport or the TCD director come out and address the drivers. Um, they were pretty much three simple questions that they had. So these are the things that they were protesting. They want to know what the rate increase is going to be so they have something to negotiate to or from. They also wanted to know what time rate three is going to uh, be moved back to 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. because that's currently midnight. And then the other thing was they wanted to discuss the option of temporary permit taxis before the government proceeds with allowing uh, the idea of allowing private cars to transport visitors. So those are the three things, uh, main things that they were actually um, protesting on. And Michael Daniel says, seeking clarity, were the drivers or the cars denied entry? Um, well, according to the article, it says taxi drivers. So I'm going to, based on the Royal Gazette article, say the taxis um, that were protesting, and I guess they identified themselves in a lineup. So um, we will take it that with the taxi driver. What are your thoughts, the audience? Um, again, is, is it a democracy? Suzanne Ingham says this is no democracy. It's more uh, dictatorship. Um, do the taxi drivers have a right to be this upset? Do they have a right to be upset? What are your thoughts? Do they, I mean, do they 
even, should they even be protesting this? Is it something worth protesting? What are your thoughts? It's interesting to me because I, I'd like to say I don't have a dog in this fight, but the truth is we all do because the transport industry plays a vital role in our country. And I'm not just talking about tourists and visitors. Maya reminds us on this show about being safe on our roads. Part of that is knowing that drinking and alcohol is a big part of our culture. Taxi drivers play a huge role in that. Being present at times and hours to get people home safely. So this is bigger than just, you know, how we feel taxi drivers may be or just tourists. They play an important role in our community overall. We need to figure something out. And part of that is having adult conversations. Allowing people the right to protest and figuring out a way forward that's in the best interest, wait for it, not of the taxi drivers, nor the government, but for Bermuda, Bermudians, and everyone who benefits from our public transport system. Chikarena says, I think TCD parking lot is private. Grocery store parking lots are private and you need permission to do anything not customer related. I think it's the same at TCD, I could be wrong. Um, you could be right, but I would think that TCD might be public, Shika, simply because, I mean, it's paid for by the public, but no. Grocery store is a private entity, TCD, uh, is TCD private? I would think that it's a public entity. So if, if, if it's public and it's paid for by the taxpayers, then I would say that it's public. Uh, Farrah Palacio said, I did my Googles and it only states it is a government building. That means public to me. <laughs> well, Farrah, you know how things are, right? They may say the building's public, but the parking lot's private. You know how they be. So maybe we could get, some, um, get that defined over the next couple of episodes. Uh, we'll figure it out. But keep the com comments coming. But we have a very important conversation coming up and I hope that you all do us a favor you make sure you like, uh, love, you share this conversation because I think uh, we had a great conversation yesterday about the state of the construction industry with Alex DeCuto. And today we have another great conversation with Dr. Mark Ishard about uh, the role of ASU uh, bias and the role it plays for Bermuda. And I hope that you all have your questions and your comments ready as we uh, head to school this morning and have an engaging conversation, but only after, only after, we bring Maya Palacio in for your daily hour news break. Oh, good morning, good morning. Greetings, MP, how are you? Feeling good, interesting, interesting discussion as I try to find out myself behind the scenes, like, is it privately owned, is it public? I wasn't able to find anything quick enough, so that's going to be my little bit of homework from today. Yeah, yeah, I, it's it's always interesting these things, and I I I think what I'm going to do as well is I will reach out to the minister of transport to try to get some answers as well. Uh, my only thing with this is I think if people are protesting um, and no one's life is in danger. Uh, they should be allowed to protest. Um, I know protests, some people are concerned. Now, TCD officers maybe have been concerned that it's not enough space in our parking lot and we don't want to inconvenience people. And no one likes to go into TCD, right? So they're already angry going in there to, to, to wait, right? So they're probably trying to save that. But if it's one thing I learned growing up, Maya, I was born in the 80s. And in the 80s, there were a lot of marches and protests, a lot. And one thing I learned at that time was these things will inconvenience you, whether it's the buses shutting down, those big um, the people picketing in front of, like 
in like parking lots and the airport and stuff like that. People laying down. I remember one of the first videos I saw in the eighties, Maya, was a guy. Tell me if you remember this audience, a guy going down the docks and laying down in front of a big Mack truck, literally right putting his body on the line and laying down in front of that. I remember this. That's what I remember. And it was all inconvenience in the entire population. That's what I remember. So when I see this, um, it tells me that we probably don't have the freedoms we actually had back then. In mm -hmm. fact, we have an organization that benefited from the protest then who now want to put a stop before it can happen. So it's, it's, it's all interesting um, how we look at it, but some interesting times back then. The old days, Maya, the old days. Yeah, I, I can... I can just say that things are different. I feel them. I feel that it's different. Anyway, good morning, good morning, everyone. This is your daily hour news break brought to you by People's Pharmacy. Starting off the news this morning, as I mentioned in the news break earlier, just there's been a multiple vehicle collision and a woman has been injured. Now, this happened shortly before 8 p.m. on Wednesday, February the 7th. Police and other first responders were dispatched to a report of a multi vehicle collision involving a motorcycle and several cars on South Road Paget in the junction with White Sands Road. Now, details surrounding the accident are limited at the time. However, it is believed that a female motorcyclist may have sustained a head injury in the collision. No other persons were reported to be injured. Vision her a speedy recovery um, and less of that. Definitely. And also, if you witness the collision again, you can always call two on one or speak to an officer that you know. Now, again, we talked about and Jamal went into a lot of detail, so I'll keep it brief. But taxi drivers gathered at the transport control department on the morning of February 7th to stage a protest. However, they were unable to enter the ground. So they basically just drove around the facilities multiple times with officers you know, stationed at the entrances of TCD. Now, here's a quick video that courtesy of Brand News that you can watch just to see exactly what happened and how it looked. Certainly weren't getting in there. <laughs> no, they were not. Yeah, they're definitely being blocked off. It was, all they could do is just travel around and around. Wow. wow. I, I have no more comments on it. I just, uh, I'll reach out to the minister for a comment and hopefully I can get something to share uh, tomorrow. All right. Well, on other news, the Bermuda Electronic Light Company Limited, or Belco as we know it more, has announced a partnership with Northland's Primary School to support their Odyssey program. Now, the Odyssey program is an after-school club that meets once a week, and the club provides an opportunity for students to engage in weekly activities with Belco staff, who provide students with hands-on learning experience to teach both engineering and critical thinking. Now, the program is designed for 9 to 11-year-old students and provides awareness of Belco operations, as well as activities that focus on science, technology, engineering and mathematics, also known as STEM. Now, the principal of Northlands, Mrs. Darrell, said that she looks forward to continuing the partnership with Balco for the Kids Odyssey program. She envisions that after-school clubs as an opportunity for students to engage in weekly activities with Balco volunteers who provide opportunities for the students to have hands-on learning experiences, experiences she believes will give them exposure to the 21st century skills that the students will need to be successful in the workplace. Mm, good stuff. I'm not, getting, I'm not going to knock it. That's good stuff. And I suppose if any other, you know, school across Bermuda has this same sort of initiative, they could probably reach out to Balco, see if they could bring it into other schools as well. Now, in other news, and this is something that we tend to think about after the fact, but think about it really domestic abuse and life-saving relationship education. I mean, how many times do we actually shed light on these topics before it becomes headline news? So this one is brought to you by people on this island that are just trying really hard to bring awareness. So Madeline Maddie Burkett is a domestic abuse survivor and award-winning advocate from the US, and she will take part in a local educational series. Now the event in collaboration with Bermuda is Love will be held at BUEI on February the 16th at 6 p.m. and is part of an ongoing effort by Tammy Richardson Augustus to bring life-saving relationship health education 
to Bermuda. So this year's event will coincide with Teen Dating Awareness Month and will provide an exclusive opportunity for the audience to view a captivating short film on child's experience of abuse, be enlightened by Susan Burkett's story, and hear from a curated list of local thought leaders, including Javon Williams, Chairman of the Coalition of Protection of Children, and also Mackenzie Cole Tuckett from Girl Empowerment, a nonprofit celebration and education, empowerment, and equality of women. So if you are interested and you want to go to be a part of this, you can RSVP at BermudaIsLove at gmail.com. Nice. Nice. Got some hard hitting, um, good hitting hitters right there, some good people. Yeah. So it's going to be very intriguing, interesting, educational, number one. I think it's something that honestly, Everyone, if you can make it, make it and just go and be there. Um, in other news, so the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sports, Owen Dow, has attended and is currently attending so the 2024 first quarter Caribbean tourism meet in St. Martin. Now, this gathering, a host of by the Honorable President uh, there, her team is an opportunity for collaboration with the Caribbean partners and strengthening Bermuda's efforts in advancing sustainable tourism initiatives outlined in the National Tourism plan. So moreover, it says that Bermuda acknowledges the significance of sustainable tourism in safeguarding our culture and environment assets. By collaborating with our Caribbean partners through initiatives like the CTO, we can collectively advocate for sustainable practices that benefit our economy and diverse culture. And that's coming from the minister himself. So he concluded by saying, I'm grateful for the opportunity to attend the insightful CTO meeting and look forward to the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport supporting Bermuda to have a growing and balanced tourism sector. No comment. Well, that's that's my wrap up for the news this morning. As we all know, um, well, hopefully everyone does know, but the 15 year old Susan Square, she was found. Uh, she was missing, but two hours later, the police did confirm that she was found safe and well. I know we have reported on her um, going missing quite often on the island, but she was found very safely within two hours of the report going out. That is good. How's the weather looking? Well, the weather today is not looking that great. There are a couple of sunny breaks with a few blustery showers, it says. So so it's going to be downpouring a bit, which isn't good for our roads, as we already know. Potholes are, potholes are already a huge topic across the island, huge inconvenience and huge safety um, controls, too, because it's getting really, really bad out there on the road. So please be mindful. All righty. Um, thank you so much for that, Maya. Um, so my days of the year, I'm going to let you choose. All right. I like when you choose, when I give you a bunch. I know, I know what you're going to choose. All right. So here we go. I'll be shocked if you don't choose what I think. And I'll tell you if you were right. Well, then why? Today, because I want to know if you're right. I'm trying to figure out if I understand you. Okay. All right. So we've got Opera Day. We've got Laugh and Get Rich Day. That Thursday, we've got Kite Flying Day. And then Actually, this one's this, this week is International Networking Week. Which one would you like, Maya? How do you know which one I'm going to choose? Because I don't even know which one I want to choose. Oh, I thought you were going to choose opera. Okay, opera was a close contender, but I'm really curious as to what... You said today's Fat Day? Fat Thursday. Fat Thursday. I'm really curious to know what that one says and what that one's about. And then I also love kite flying, so... Okay, well, let's... Mm. Like, Fat Thursday, folks, for your days of the year. History of Fat Thursday and appreciation of donuts is nothing new for the polls. And um, for the polls. And anyway, it is believed that the tradition of buying and sharing, what's this, Pazaki, to celebrate Fat Thursday dates right back to the 16th century. Although focus of the celebration hasn't shifted throughout the ages, notes from history suggest that the recipes have evolved. So it's about eating donuts. Okay. So how to I celebrate? Can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you already know how to celebrate then. This is amazing. Do not place actually just on the block. Yeah. Oh, I know exactly what I'm going to get. Kite flying. Well, it says kites have been bringing joy and relaxation since the fifth century in China. Kites are made of different parts uh, that, when working together, allow for the high flying tricks that we all love to watch. Those who are uh, those parts of the wings, the tethers, and anchors. The kite is designated as a heavier than aircraft that is tethered with wing uh, surfaces that react as the air drags and lifts around um, lifts around them. National Kite Flying Day was created to remind us of the feeling of freedom that one feels when guiding a kite through uh, the currents of air. I love a good kite flying day. I love Good Friday. Oh, okay. I, I, I had no idea. 
And I just want to touch on this one um, before we head out, um, before you head out, sorry, International Networking Week. Um, International Networking Week is it allows for people to come together to listen to key networking specialists across the world to talk about major issues and problems present in the everyday world. Now, folks, you know how important I think networking is. So how to celebrate net, um, International Networking Week? It's all about getting out there and uh, learn about professional attire, etiquette, and sponsorships. Um, but I want people to think differently uh, when it comes to networking. I would love for people to, you know, let's use yesterday as guest as an example. Yesterday as guest, Alex Dakota, that was simply me reaching out to him on LinkedIn. Networking has changed. If you're an introvert, you no longer have to get out and be amongst people. It's helpful, but you have the internet at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. If you go somewhere and meet someone, that's networking. See how you can be a benefit to them and how they can be a benefit to you. So happy International Networking Week um, and meet someone new. See, a, see what value you can bring to them and what they can bring to you. Maya, have you networked lately? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's like my every single day routine out here. Yeah, I, I, I do it pretty often. I'm, I, I still think, I don't think, you know, someone said to me, oh, you've become such an introvert. No, nah, it's not that I've introverted. I'm just cautious as I get older of who I, you know, put myself in spaces with. That's it. That's it. But I was just thinking about like the fact that the other night I was at uh, the celebration of Bob Marley's birthday and I got to obviously meet his granddaughter, meet one of his daughters as well. And it was just like, I'm there in this space because I went out and found a story about community and cultural connection in Toronto in the space that was curated by his um, granddaughter, Denisha. So that was oh. just those connections there. She makes you meeting people. All right. Well, Maya's meeting some big people, folks. Maya, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. See you soon. All right, my Palacio folks. Um, all right, we're going to take a quick break. Dr. Gishard's coming up. Very important conversation. But in the meantime, while this break is playing, make sure you give us a thumbs up, a love, a like, and do us a favor. Share this conversation with your friends, your family, your colleagues, because you don't want to miss. I have a little announcement next week. Next week, I'm going to share an announcement with you guys. Personal. Stick with us. Let's face it, life can be a little <coughs> wild, but shopping doesn't have to be. I choose Peoples so that whether it's a prescription that needs to be filled, a toy for my little terror, or a gift for a new addition to the family, um, we'll see about that. Everything's available in one convenient location. Some call it Peoples. I call it my one-stop shop in the city. Peoples, we're here for you. Welcome to the new bulk store, Lindo's. All righty, welcome back to the big show. I'm Jamal Hartman. It's the Daily Hour brought to you by the BAC Group for Companies, Medical Halls, Windows, and People's Pharmacy. Please don't forget to subscribe on our website, thedailyhour.com. Follow us on all of our social media channels to stay up to date with all that we have going on. Help us grow beyond the mic as we do our part to continue to improve our community. All righty. Um, well, hey, I just want to say this before we bring our guests for the day in. Uh, Burmy Girl just became a YouTube member, and we appreciate that. Thank you so much, Burmy Girl, for becoming a YouTube member. You too can become a member and financially support the efforts of myself and my colleagues in waking up and doing this with you every day. But thank you to Burmy Girl, and thank you to everyone who continues to financially support us. Um, it's not easy, but we are extremely grateful. All right, without further ado, let's bring our guest for the day. Let's give a warm, warm welcome and Congratulations to Dr. Mark Richard on his new position. Uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> I see what you did there. How are you? How are you? Good, good. Thank you for having me once again. No, thank, thank you for coming, but let's talk about it. I mean, 
you used to come on and you know tell us about hurricanes and and the weather and now it's like i go on linkedin speaking of networking and i say i've got to give a congratulations and there it is dr mark ishard has moved on to a new role before we get into the conversation let's let's talk about that speak to us a bit about that well thanks thanks very much um you know i'm still of course a meteorologist at heart so i'll just start off by saying that uh you know, we have a good a good weekend in store for us with high pressure coming in. Uh, so I'll just start off with that. Um, but uh, I will also say I'm not any longer the director of the Bermuda Weather Service. So in case that doesn't pan out, you can't blame me. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm actually I've moved to the um, ASU Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, where I'm the chief operating officer. Uh, I was very honored and uh, humbled to be asked to serve the Institute by our board and uh, the chance to go back to my roots in a, in a scientific organization. Uh, before I was a meteorologist, I was a student and I was interested in environmental sciences. Uh, I worked under Dr. Kent Simmons, uh, at what was at the time the Bermuda Biological Station for Research. And so you you do remember correctly, Jamal, the, uh, the name of the Institute that I'm now part of again. Um, it's now become AC bias, so I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. All um, right. So, so hold on. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you, when did the name change? Because again, I don't want to age myself. So the name was officially changed back in 2007. So when when I was a student there, the, the name was the Bermuda Biological Station for Research, and that was in the late 1990s, um, the mid the mid 90s. We'll, we'll, we'll leave in the 1900s. So we'll, we'll <laughs> For those who don't know, um, tell us a bit about the ASU Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, because again, I have not visited since I was probably primary or first couple of years in high school. So the Institute has been around uh, in Bermuda for over 120 years. That's quite an accomplishment when you think about all the organizations we think of as being. Uh, old here in Bermuda, um, BIOS or ASU BIOS is, is one of the oldest. Um, it started as a small biological marine center in Flats in 1903. Um, uh, Bermuda Biological Station was formally incorporated in 1926. Um, and the station has been and still is a US nonprofit corporation and a Bermuda registered charity and it moved to operations uh, to Ferry Beach in 1932. Uh, so Biostation, as it became known locally, became, uh, began making routine measurements uh, of the deep ocean off of Bermuda in 1954, and has been doing so continuously since then. So seven years worth of uh, ocean data, and it's the longest running continuous monitoring of the ocean and the local marine conditions, but anywhere in the world. Uh, so we have the longest running time series of ocean conditions anywhere. And the the most recent development uh, for BIOS is that BIOS and Arizona State University joined forces in 2021. Um, so that's probably why you haven't heard that much about it. Um, are still in the process of, of coming out of that. Um, but uh, at that stage, an agreement was made between the two entities so that ASU would be the sole member of that US nonprofit that I mentioned. And so BIOS is now officially a unit of the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory and the School of Ocean Futures at Arizona State University. We know it shortly as ASU BIOS. So how does the relationship work with a U.S. scientific nonprofit based in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the the reason there is a U.S. nonprofit based in Bermuda doing ocean science is, is pretty straightforward. It's very easy access to the deep waters of the Atlantic. If uh, such a station were based on the U.S. East Coast, for example, it would take a couple of days to get to the deep ocean. Uh, but from BIOS here in Prairie Reach, in St. George's. Um, our research vessel, the Atlantic Explorer, can get to uh, two and a half miles depth of water, or four kilometers deep, just within a couple of hours. So this uh, this access to the deep ocean is pretty unparalleled, and it allows us to have a long-running 
oceanographic research with the Atlantic right on our doorstep. In addition, of course, Bermuda's got uh, pretty good condition coral reefs. They're the northernmost reefs in the Atlantic uh, of coral and some of the healthiest reefs in the world. Uh, so coral reefs have also been uh, a long, uh, long standing research topic for, for our, our researchers here at Bios. Interesting. I, I, I mean, you just shared an interest. In fact, an audience, if you have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to ask them, put them in. Uh, Charles H. Just II, he's like, since 1903, who knew, right? Um, interesting, right, Charles? Um, well, let's go, let's let's speak a bit more about um, how the ASU bias uh, relationship, like how it actually uh, worked for Bermuda. So uh, we, you know, we undertake a, a number of different research programs centered around some of the things I just talked about: uh, deep water uh, research, um, uh, life in the ocean, science and society, and of course we have a lot of educational programs as well, which I can talk about in a little bit. Um, but the the why would we, a small independent research institute, affiliate ourselves with a a top university in the U.S.? Um, you know, all of, the, all of these activities that you see on the screen here um, are, are, are very expensive to maintain, especially considering we are a check, check. So we've always relied on U.S. federal research grants, um, such as from the National Science Foundation to operate, and, and also philanthropy and corporate sponsorships locally to support our local education activities. Um, so any uh, fee-paying Visiting groups as well make up any shortfall, um, but this is kind of an uh, that had become sort of an unsustainable bis business model for us. Uh, we were kind of going year to year, maybe two years to two years, uh, and uh, being associated with uh, a major university really sort of stabilizes our operations. So at the time, uh, fortunately, ASU was looking to ramp up its global environmental. Uh, sustainability and solutions programs in an outfit called the Global Futures Lab. And it turns out you can't examine the Earth system from the middle of the desert in Arizona without including some efforts also focused on the oceans. So ASU was able to make an arrangement, an agreement with BIOS and some other organizations based on Hawaii uh, to establish a presence in both the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans uh, in pretty short order. Um, and so what that did was it stabilized our financial position, our cash flow. It provided tenure track faculty positions that were funded by ASU and access to a very large, diverse student population interested in marine science. Now, with, you know, as with any mergers and acquisitions, the details take a long time to iron out. So we continue to work towards full integration with uh, Arizona State. However, unlike most mergers and acquisitions, no positions were made redundant, and that stabilized the institution as a whole. Um, so it's, it's been quite exciting to think about the opportunities for BIOS. Um, but I, 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 I want to just kind of go back, if it's okay, Jamal, to, to just elaborate a little bit on what, what it is that research and that education opportunity is. Um, uh, so you know, we, we do have these long running time series that I mentioned, we do the long term records of the ocean, but also the atmosphere since the 1980s. Um, the, the long term records of the ocean go back 70 years. Um, and we have these big installations and equipment such as that research vessel, the Atlantic Explorer, goes out to the same spot in the ocean every two weeks or so, and further out every month. And these records allow us to note these long term changes in the environment around us over very long periods of time. Um, in terms of the climate, these long-term records allow us to make conclusions about the state of the oceans, physics, chemistry, and biology. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, uh, sort of an inshore uh, part of that, in Devil's Hole, uh, there's a seasonal sort of annual deficiency in, in oxygen during the summer. That's part of the natural cycle there. And that every time we get a, a storm come through at the end of the summer, whether it's a tropical storm or a hurricane, um, that actually mixes up the ocean um, in Devil's Hole and kind of diminishes that, that oxygen minimum. So there's a lot of um, interesting inshore and nearshore work that we do as well. But offshore, the surface of the ocean 
as we all know, I've talked about here before, is um, is gradually warming up. It's gradually becoming more acidic over time, and we've been able to look at the, uh, the increases in, for example, my research was about um, has been about our hurricane intensity and the increase in hurricane activity. Um, we've been able to correlate that directly with the, the changes in the, the surface ocean. Mm-hmm. Now, it turns out you can't uh, look at the sort of chemical and physical properties of the ocean without thinking about its its biology as well. So the, the algal blooms that happen in the Sargasso Sea, that's the part of the ocean, the Atlantic that Bermuda sits in, um, both uh, respond to and cause responses in the ocean around it. So over those long decades, um, we've been uh, seeing changes in the marine creatures' ability to grow their shells due to, change, due to those changes in the acidity and, and the temperature in the, in the, the, the surrounding ocean. Uh, but closer to shore, I talked about coral reefs and how uh, one of the areas of interest is their resilience to environmental changes, these warming temperatures, these um, the, um, the acidity, et cetera. Um, so that's an area of active research as well. And all of this has relevance to our society here in Bermuda and globally. Um, these, uh, these, these studies and measurements that our team creates is that are accessed by scientists and policymakers all around the world. Um, they're featured in, in reports like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And locally, we've had a, a long-standing relationship with the reinsurance industry to focus on, um, on uh, risk and natural hazards as well. All of these programs um, enable us to develop some, some really good programs for visiting researchers. Um, and ASC Bios hosts up to 700 visiting scientists and students from around the world every year. Um, so we do have accommodation on, on campus here. Uh, we do have a, a canteen, so we have facilities to host people. And we host up to 700 people a year. So that's our own sort of small, specialized contribution to tourism in Bermuda. I, I thought it. <laughs> I thought it. Yeah. So, so we're, you know, we're part of the tourism industry, if you will, but it's just a very specialized um, specialized approach to it. Um, and we also, perhaps a, 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 a more well-known fact locally is that we reach about 1,400 Bermudian school-age students and teachers annually from government and private schools. And the statistics from last year were, you know, 62% of those engagements were uh, with the government school system. Um, so uh, we reach a diverse cross-section of participants from all across our communities, different walks of life. And that internship I talk, talked about back in the, the 90s when I was a student, uh, that internship is still running today. Uh, I'm pleased to have kind of, uh, I and others here, very pleased to have been mentors to, to, to local and international students myself. So, um, you know, it's, it's really gratifying to be able to, to give back in that way. Interesting. Chica Trot just echoes what you said. Uh, BIOS plays a vital role in educating future generations of marine scientists through its internship programs, which is great for local students. Kudos for providing such great opportunities. And we'll get to the questions from the audience as well, so uh, you can keep them coming. But you said a lot today, a lot, a lot of information. <laughs> I hope that people are digesting and are able to share with an understanding of how exactly um, air shoe bias works, but can you just give some good points of the benefits for anyone who's just tuned in? What are the actual benefits of Bermuda and Bermudians um, from the relationship? Absolutely, and this is this is one of the things I'm, I'm very keen to, to get across. Um, so we're exploring very uh, new pathways to enable Bermudian students to have uh, more opportunities for university education, and this will involve some new partnerships. Uh, we already have very strong community partnerships, for example, with Bermuda College, so I'm very pleased to see um, Ms. Trotz uh, comment there. Thank you. Um, we already have these strong community partnerships with uh, Bermuda College, for example. We helped to deliver a marine science program with them, uh, where some of the college's students are already lined up to take our summer diving and reef courses for credit, um, for sort of academic credit for the college. Um, and friends of ASU Bias are already developing funds to support more of these types of efforts and even beyond marine sciences. So you've got great potential to leverage um, ASU's expertise beyond ocean sciences 
into robotics, AI, cyber risk management uh, for the benefit of the local uh, sort of risk and finance industry. And generally, we're talking about a massive U.S. university, 85,000 students on campus, 65,000 students online. Um, and so it's a it's a great opportunity to explore those, um, you know, the ability not only to send to bring students here, to send students there, but also for students that are um, needing to do online work or needing to do things on a, on a part time basis. Uh, ASU has this uh, amazing uh, set of synchronous and asynchronous uh, education uh, opportunities. Um, so all of this is likely to require an expansion and upgrades to our facilities, which in turn will provide opportunities for contractors. Uh, ASU BIOS currently employs uh, over 60 people, half of whom are Bermudians, including myself, and with the scope to grow these opportunities and partnerships, so extends the opportunity for employment and uh, for the education in general. All righty. Um, we've got um, Carpal Osteo, and I think you may have answered. She says, how many international students does it buy a year? And I think you kind of 700 you bring in, right? So I, I don't know the, the statistics of the breakdown of, of students versus, um, versus visiting researchers, um, but I will say that the vast majority of that 700 people that we attract every year are our students uh, coming from different universities, uh, even coming from some uh, high schools um, from the the U.S. primarily, but our students come from all around the world. Um, you know, back when I was a, an adjunct faculty here many years ago, we had programs with, with people from, I think it was every continent but Antarctica, um, uh, coming, in, coming and working with us here. So the reach is broad, um, and, uh, you know, that does not diminish or negate the, um, the local reach that we have as well. So double that number of people that we bring in, we actually reach locally. Um, Indeed. And you, you, I mean, you said the ocean's getting warm, but I live in um, Florida and in Florida, they don't believe any of that. So thank you for you know, let, letting us know that. But we do have a question from Mark off the sea Phillips. He says, does global warming affect the cold that surround the island? Sure. And, and yeah, that, I mean, that's a very, uh, a very useful point to, to focus on. The, the ocean warming doesn't only have an effect on hurricanes, like I study, but also um, the, the, the marine life around the uh, Coral reefs uh, do, we do see this kind of seasonal bleaching in some of the reefs. You see that the bleaching response that the coral has is basically um, the organisms expelling their plants that give them the pigment pigment when it gets too hot, when they get too stressed by the heat. Uh, and so every time it gets above a certain threshold, say 31 Celsius or thereabouts, um, you can start to see some of that bleaching. And you can see it from the shoreline in some places, like uh, you drive along Harper Road, you can see, uh, well, hopefully you're keeping your eyes on the road. Hopefully you're a passenger looking um, uh, looking in the, in the water off the Harbor Road, you can see some of that coral bleaching at the height of the summer and towards the end of the summer. So, so yes, in, in short, as the ocean gradually warms and we get these seasonal heat waves occasionally, just like you get heat waves in the atmosphere, you get heat waves in the ocean as well. Um, you can see uh, coral bleaching from time to time here, but it's not as widespread as some other places. Our, um, our brothers and sisters to the south, um, they have uh, massive bleaching events sometimes that lead to uh, coral death, and um, we don't seem to be seeing much of that, probably because the um, you, you have uh, very deep water here as well, so the corals can actually have a uh, refuge down the sides of the platform. All righty. Uh, Karen Simmons says, uh, my daughter was an intern at BIOS for two years starting at Berkeley. She is now working in this school since graduating from university. Her roommate was working there from August uh, to December 2023. Good stuff. We love it. Um, Mark Arthur C. Phillips has another question. He, he's asking, does the BIOS station collaborate with other scientific research centers around the world? Absolutely. Yeah, we do. We do have um, uh, beyond our sort of strategic partnership with, with ASU, um, we have many universities that we collaborate with or from around the world. Um, and I could rattle off a, a number of names, uh, just uh, my research program from uh, the risk prediction initiatives several years ago 
had researchers from uh, all over the United States, uh, Europe, University of Oxford, um, Princeton, Florida State, Penn State, uh, you know, uh, BU, Amsterdam, there's a number of different um, universities. So, so yes, we have uh, wide reaching collaborations and, um, and I'll also reiterate that the data that we produce, those long-term time series data are accessed by researchers all around the world. This this is good stuff, man. I, I mean, we, we miss you. At you. We will definitely miss you as all normal working conversations, but this is good information. I, I, I like these conversations where it's like, oh, who knew, right? Who knew? So uh, definitely appreciate you making time. Um, hopefully we can get the Daily Hour community, take some of our um, you know audience down to explore what it is that you do sometime this summer and um, see it first. So one closing comment I want to make, and thank you for reminding me, um, a final plug that we will be hosting an open house and other events in early June around World Questions Day, June 8th. Uh, so save the date. You can come down and check us out at Ferry Reach in St. George's. And to learn more about our, our organization, um, just visit online, uh, bios.asu.edu. All right. That's where you can check them out. Uh, Karen Simmons says, uh, Roger Williams University, Bristol, Rhode Island. All right. Well, my, my stuff is wrong. Rhode Island. My cousin went to Roger Williams University as well. But, uh, sir, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Keep rocking with that Daily Hour mug, and we'll definitely be in touch. I think June 8th might work for us all. Great. All Thank right. You. Thanks so much, Dr. Kishart. All the best. All right, folks, if you appreciated that conversation, found the information helpful, please give us a thumbs up, a love, a like. Make sure you share this conversation with your friends, your family, your colleagues. Folks, these are conversations uh, full of information that we probably need to know, honestly. As Farah Palacio said, great info. Um, it's the more we know, the more we know. So again, please share the conversation with your friends, your family, your colleagues. We're gonna take a final break, come back, Whoever gets this question right, and this question is, let's just say, based on today's conversation, it's a name that place, based on today's conversation, think somebody will be eligible with Carol Griffith, Sherilyn Johnson, and Traveling Trotty for tomorrow's giveaway. Hi there, welcome to Madaku House. We're located at number six Bakery Lane. I can't wait to show you all of the great stuff that we carry. Come on inside, let's see. Let's kick it off in the footwear department. When it comes to footwear, we carry functional, comfortable, orthopedic and waterproof shoes. We have construction shoes, golf shoes, shoes for walking, shoes for boating. We even have shoes for pickleball. We have shoes for everyone. With brands by Skechers, Atrax, Propay, Easy Street, Nursemates, Clogs, Avenger, Cherokee, Cat, Frog Talks and DeWalt. The list goes on. Take a look at our workwear for construction workers and tradesmen. Durable, stretchable in all the right places and plenty of options for tools and accessories. Pair with our wide range of tough and comfortable footwear, you can't go wrong. Long days, long shifts, you no longer have to endure comfortable underwear. Designed by Narcissus, we now offer premium undergarments by Swoop that are unique, fun, comfortable and functional. The only underwear you'll ever want to wear. Who says high quality functional products can be stylish and comfortable at the same time? Speaking of stylish, we also have top quality running, walking and workout apparel by Skechers in a variety of sizes for men and women. Cool, breathable and dry. With our wide selection of Skechers footwear, you'll look great before, during and after your workout. As you can see, Medical House really is a one-stop shop for everybody. We can't wait to see you. You'll be surprised at everything we have to offer at our huge new retail and wholesale location on Bakery Lane. All righty, welcome back. Thanks again to Dr. Mark Shard for uh, joining us from ASU Bias. Again, if you appreciate today's conversation, please give us a thumbs up, a love, a like. Make sure you share these conversations with your friends, your family, your colleagues. And 
even though you don't like this information that could help all of us. All right, it's time. Uh, thanks again to the BAC group of companies, Medical Arts Lenders and People's Pharmacy for ensuring we can have these important community conversations on a regular basis. It's time for the Daily Play brought to you by Bermuda Trivia, now available at stores throughout Bermuda. Follow Bermuda Trivia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to find out why it's Bermuda's favorite trivia game. All right, audience, here you go. It's a name that place. And well, due to our guest today, hopefully you all get this right. Let's do it. Audience and the first person whose answer shows up correctly on my screen first will be eligible. Audience, what is the world's largest body of water? NTS showed up first. NTS, you're back in the running. You're back in the draw. It is the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Suzanne Ingham also yes, Pacific Ocean. But NTS, you'll be joining uh, Traveling Trotty, Sherilyn Johnson, and um, Traveling Trotty in this week's draw tomorrow. The Pacific Ocean. Was that too easy, folks? Everybody got it. Uh, Janet Maynard, Pacific Ocean. Sherilyn Johnson, Pacific Ocean, Heavenly and Storm, Pacific Ocean. Yeah, you all got it because you are a smart group of people. Um, that's why you got it. All right, folks. So uh, what a show. I just want to say this regarding the TCD and, and protest. And, um, it's, it's unfortunate that we live in a time where people are having the right to protest uh, stifled by politics. But my hope is that the greater community sees this and responds to it uh, collectively. What that looks like, I don't know. But what I will say to anyone in the community is this. Don't wait until it's your issue to stand up. Because if you don't back others, there'll be no one there when it's your turn to back you. As far as the conversation with Dr. Mark Gishard, uh, I appreciate, I mean, like I said, I haven't been to the bio station since it was the biological station, right? And just by audience, have you been to bios in the last five years? Yes or no, just answer yes or no. Have you been there in the last five years? because I have not been there since I was a school child. And so having a conversation like this has helped me go on their website and do some research and get an understanding of what it is they do. So we're gonna have a TVH community. Um, we're gonna go down there together and we're gonna see what they do. We're gonna learn about how it benefits us and impacts Bermuda and Bermudians. And see, look at that. Everyone's saying no, no, no one's been there in the last five years, Suzanne Ingham. Nachika Trot, Hedeline Swan, Karen Simmons says yes. Um, Farrah Palacio, no. So let's let's get there. Let's let's figure out what it is in person that they do and how we benefit and how we can encourage others to, I guess, learn and care more about our environment. And that includes the ocean. Um, all right. So that said, it's time for your daily inspiration. Let's, let's see what we got in here for you. Um, well. Here we go. The sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. Hmm. I like that one. That's Leo Tolstoy. Leo Tolstoy. The sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. You know, I say to people all the time, you know, I don't think we necessarily need religion to have a moral barometer. And people say, well, what would your moral barometer be? And I say humanity. Humanity. We shouldn't need religion or a book to tell us right from wrong. Something should be normal. It should be normal not to want to cause harm to others, be it physically, emotionally, or mentally. So the sole meaning of life to serve humanity. And that's in business as well and community. So that's what I'll leave you with for today. Um, folks, uh, 
Thanks again. Uh, we appreciate it. You don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already on our website. Even if you think you have, do it again. It doesn't hurt. Go on our website, thedailyhour.com. Make sure you're subscribed. Follow us on all of our social media channels to stay up to date with all that we have going on. Help us grow beyond the mic as we do our part to continue to improve our community. Thanks again to our partners, the BAC Group of Company Med Companies, Medical Office Lindos, and People's Pharmacy for ensuring that we can have these conversations with you on a daily basis. As always, we appreciate you, we love you, and we thank you for making us part of your daily routine. If all goes well, we'll be back to do this again with you tomorrow. I'm Jamal Hartman. Please do make it a safe and a great day. And before I say what I'm going to say, uh, Farrah Palacio, I love this. Normal is defined by the collective. So if the collective isn't caring, well, she has a point. Folks, I am is out. Peace. Have a good one.